This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 12, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, as we potentially face another, we discuss how Alaska can and should control the impact of oil cycles on the state budget. Second, we discuss why we support a new ballot initiative designed to impose campaign contribution limits in state races but explain why it's only part of the needed solution. And third, we discuss why Frank Murkowski's proposal to shine more light on the Permanent Fund Corporation's in-state investment program is like shutting the barn door after some of the cows are already out, but that it's better than doing nothing at all. And now, let's join Michael. So let's dive into it, though. Um, so... Uh, we've got an impact on oil cycles, uh, and this is, of course, we've talked about this in the state of Alaska, running from one side of the ship to the other, feast or famine. Uh, but now, since we're facing another one with the whole Saudi thing and all the other stuff, uh, we should control the impact of these cycles, and we can. You've got a whole, you got a whole rundown on how this is going to work. Give me the, give me the, the details. Well, James Brooks has an article in um, in the Alaska Beacon that's been picked up by the APRN, the the Alaska Public uh, News, um, about and the headline is Saudi Arabia's oil production cut could affect Alaska's state finances, and it's about the potential that the that the most recent Saudi unilateral cut in production could have uh, on prices, uh, lifting up prices, which is certainly what Saudi hopes, um, and and increasing them above. Uh, above uh, the projections that, that the FY24 budget's based on. Now, before we get too carried away in this conversation, I, I, I did my morning uh, uh, spreadsheet on where futures prices are. And, and as of this morning, uh, morning's opening, market opening, FY24 prices are down, are, are in fact down $2 from, uh, from the projection uh, that were included in the spring revenue forecast. So I don't think we need to be jumping up and down yet. Uh, thinking that uh, that this is going to be an issue, uh, but James is is reporting is really on uh, a forecast that the uh, EIA published last week. The Federal Energy Information Agency Administration, rather, uh, published last week. Uh, uh, it publishes monthly a, a, an assessment of where the oil market is and a projection of prices um, about a year and a half, eighteen months, uh, eighteen months ahead. And the EIA's forecast, which was released, uh, April 4th, May forecast, which was released last week, was an eye-opener. I was surprised uh, uh, at it uh, at the time. It forecasts uh, FY24 prices. Now, keep in mind that the, that the state's revenue forecast, spring revenue forecast for FY24 is $73 a barrel. Um, the EIA published a, a, a forecast looking ahead of uh, essentially the FY24 over the FY24 period, the state's FY24 period, uh, that would average out at $81 a barrel, uh, $8 a barrel over uh, the sp state's spring revenue forecast. And forecast, uh, EIA is forecasting an FY25 price uh, of $85 a barrel uh, against the state's forecast of, let's see, $69 a barrel. So EIA's forecast a significant uh, price ramp up 
largely as a result of the Saudi action and their read that Saudi is going to take the steps necessary to uh, to uh, to maintain a higher price level. Now, as I said, let's not get let's not jump too far ahead in the story. What's happened in the in the subsequent days is the is the oil price, oil forecast, oil futures price has gone down. Uh, this morning, averaging out at uh, $71 for FY24, $2 below the state's revenue forecast. And what's really going on is Russian oil, uh, which uh, Russia politically had agreed with Saudi to restrict its oil output as well with the rest of OPEC and agreed to restrict its output as well. But as it needs additional revenues, Russia is putting a lot of oil on the water and it's really driving the price of uh, price of oil down. Questions whether... Russia can sustain that, whether Saudi's action will dry up uh, uh, enough enough oil to uh, not only offset the Russian impact, but also to, to increase the price. We'll see. But this all brings up this all brings up an issue that we continually have in Alaska and was one we had at the beginning of, of last session as well, which is oil prices go up, oil prices go down. And Alaska just seems to ride, sort of like a surfer, seems to ride that wave. <laughs> Alaska's fiscal situation seems to ride that wave up and down. And it has, you know, bad implications in the sense that when we have a surplus, we uh, or when we have uh, uh, high revenues, oil revenues, we create all these programs um, and do all this spending that when oil prices settle back down, put us in a put us in a in a in a bad situation and lead to things right. like PFD cuts to to continue to fund those programs that that, that looked okay when oil prices were high, but shocking, but, uh, shocking, I tell you. I mean, this, this is the problem. I mean, we've done this for years. I mean, and we'll have what will the worst part is is that it'll be one year of a high oil price and it spikes and they've got all this money and they're like, oh, we've got something, and then the next year it craters and then it's like, what do we do now? We've created all. I mean. You would think that they would learn. You only have to stick your finger in a light socket once or twice to figure it out, but not these guys. And what's and what's really surprising about this, Michael, is we have a solution. I mean, we can control oil prices. Alaska can control oil prices as they feed into the budget. <clears throat> and it's a solution we're familiar with. When we do the POMV draws, the percent of market value draws from the permanent fund earnings, we use a five-year average, a rolling five-year average each year to to, to backward looking five year average to calculate uh, what the amount of the draw ought to be. When we do permanent fund dividends, uh, we do a five year average of what the earning earnings have been when we used to do permanent fund dividends. And when we still calculate the statutory permanent fund dividend, we do a five year average uh, looking back um, and, and use that backward looking sort of dollars in our pockets already uh, uh, backward looking uh, calculation. So we know how to do this. We know how to control uh, 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 variables that would otherwise affect us. When you use a, a rolling five-year average, historical five-year average, you take out, you know, the, the 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 variances that result from, you know, the stock market going crazy one year and crashing crashing the next year. You you smooth that out over time. When the same thing when you do permanent fund dividends on a rolling five-year average, they still vary. But they don't vary as much as they would right. if you were if you were predicating them on oh, what do we think earnings are going to be next year? Let's use earnings right. next year as our as our forecast tool. So we know how to do this. We know how to smooth out financial variations, but we don't do it with oil. I, in February, for those interested in the details, uh, in February February third, I did a my Alaska landmine column that week was was headlined how Alaska can control oil revenue. And I looked at a lot of a lot of different ways to get to control revenues in the same way that <clears throat> that uh, we use with uh, the POMB draw and with the PFD draw. And and it turns out that five years we still have a lot of variability uh, when we use a five year average. So the best approach is a ten year average, and an even better approach is a ten year average with sideboards. It can't increase or decrease more than 5%. The oil revenues can't, traditional right. revenues can't increase or decrease more than 5%. Right. But, and, and that and that would put us in control of oil revenues. We no longer would be the tail on OPEC's dog, you know, just whacking back and forth as as, uh, as prices went up and down. We'd have a smooth uh, curve 
uh, of revenues. And that would prevent things <clears throat> it would have had we used it in the past and would, if we, if we use it going forward, would have prevented us, as you say, said earlier, running from one side of the ship to the other uh, when we have uh, when we have oil revenues, creating all these programs, creating all these expectations, creating all these additional constituency groups that then when when oil prices come down, when revenues come down, then go and lobby the legislature and say, oh, my God, you know, we can't we can't we can't, you know, die. We can't we can't go away now that you've created us. We've got to keep going. Right. Uh, it, it would it would it would moderate all those oil constituency groups in a better way. Oil revenue constituency groups in a better way, frankly, I think, than uh, than the spending cap uh, that some people have talked about. Because spending caps, spending, spending caps, frankly, always go stale over time. And the ones we've been talking about, as, as we've talked about on previous shows, have the ones we're currently talking about have the unintended consequences of killing the PFD. So. I think I think you know we we have a tool as we face potentially another situation where oil prices are going to go a little crazy on us. If you believe the EIA may forecast that they're going to go a little crazy on us, we have a tool uh, that we can control. That it's a tool we know we understand. We've applied to the PFD, we've applied to the POMB, and we should be applying to oil going forward. This is interesting because this is <clears throat> this is kind of I mean, we don't talk much about it, but number four of the Charter of Changes is to change the funding and the way that we do the budget. Um, and I had suggested back when I created the Charter of Changes that maybe we could take a page from the book of the permanent fund and use a five year rolling average of revenues. And I mean, this is the same kind of thing that you're talking about, because there was nothing worse. <clears throat> I still remember uh, and I talk about this all the time, but I still remember back in the late aughts maybe 2010, 2012, whatever it was, when Sean Parnell was writing a budget based on, you know, based on the fall forecast at $114 a barrel and oil had just cratered and it was down in the $68, $70 a barrel range. And yet he was still writing a budget based on $115 a barrel oil. It was pie in the sky. And I said, why are we doing, why do we not look back and see what we've gotten for the last five years and create an average? And you're saying 10 years is even better. Okay, great. You're right. That does smooth the highs and the lows out. Why aren't we doing this, Brad? Well, it's, it's because it's a couple of things. One, we've created all these constituency groups and what they found is when oil prices go up, they can create these new programs and get this additional spending. And then when oil prices come down, come down, they can cry enough to get, to get, for example, in the, in the current era, get the PFD cut uh, and sustain their program. So it, we've created, we've created a, an environment in which we are rewarding um, uh, constituency groups and we're rewarding those who play to constituency groups, legislators, Play to constituency groups based on high oil prices. So you you keep you you keep this this running you know futures based uh, oil revenues so that when when it runs up you can take advantage of it and you can be the savior and you can fund you know everything you want to fund uh, all around all around the state. You can create all these no, new programs. You can satisfy all the constituency groups um, and then you know you just you brace for it and and take it out of the PFD. Create theories about why you can take right. it out of the PFD on the downside. So what you're saying, what you're saying is never let a crisis go to waste, especially a crisis that you can create. Yeah, it, it's it's the same thing, you know. When some parents who, you know, when Johnny passed uh, passed the dime store window in my era, when Johnny passed the dime store era and said, "I want that," the parent parents said, oh, "Okay, yeah, yeah, we can afford that right now. We'll get we'll get Johnny that." And you know, and the next time Johnny goes by the window and says, "I want that." parent isn't quite as well off, but nonetheless, you know, Johnny starts crying. And, and so the parent wants to be the hero when they've got the money and the parent's willing to, you know, do something else when, uh, when they don't have the money. And Johnny has learned his, his, the learned behavior is to cry every time he goes by the window and he doesn't get what he wants. So uh, Donna says in the chat room, HB 194 does what you're suggesting. Uh, it'll be in ways and means committee. Uh, it'll be a priority next session. It's a revenue limit. So hopefully those fall along the same lines. I mean, that's what it's going to take, right? It's going to take some kind of legislative fix for this, or in your mind, is it more of a constitutional fix? What is it, what is it going to take? Well, actually, actually it's a fix that doesn't need legislation. I mean, we, we, we set the budget based upon futures projections, um, uh, as a matter of, as a matter of policy from the administration and from the legislature. 
and creating a statute, as we found with the PFD, creating a statute doesn't necessarily secure uh, uh, how how they how they view these things. So it's really more: can we get the administration? Can we get Dunleavy, the Dunleavy right. administration, OMB, and 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 Department of, Re- of Natural Department of Revenue to to utilize that sort of budgeting approach when they go forward? And can we get the legislature, uh, the finance committees, to utilize that sort of that sort of budgeting approach? I looked at I looked at the legislation. I, I don't recall it being a ten year average, but uh, whatever it is, that's nice. But it's also ignorable <laughs> by future right. legislators. So we have to right. change the behavior. As a, a, a well, at this point, I'm very skeptical of any statutory fix on anything based on what the legislature is doing. I mean, it's all well and good, and we could battle it out in the streets all day long and have it pass, and then they could just arbitrarily ignore it when it doesn't uh when it doesn't uh you know match exactly what they need to do the problem brad uh with the discussion (laughs) the problem there's only one (laughs) there's only one problem with this um is that you know a lot of times the governor whoever the governor is the administration doesn't want i mean they've got programs that they want too right i mean they've got things that they want to address too they don't want to i mean the fact that parnell went continued to go through the whole charade of of uh, we're going to build this budget based on oil that we think is going to be fifty dollars a barrel more than it actually is, is I mean that's that was that was insanity. I mean nobody nobody looked at that and said that's a that's a reasonable budget, and yet they continued to do it because they had priorities, and that's the problem. Is the self interest of the administration would have to be set aside for something like this to be set up, and as we've seen in the past, there's nothing stopping the next administration from changing it back all over again. I mean, that's part of the problem. Yeah. Um, you know, it'd be helpful to have it in statute. At least you'd have something to re- to refer to. Uh, but it, 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 the, the, the political, <laughs> we do have a screwed up system. The, the, the political sensitivities of the moment outweigh what's long-term best policy. I mean, we're, we've got that going on with the PFD now. Best long-term policy is to keep hands, to keep money in the hands of Alaska families working Alaska families. The, by far, it's a, it's a, it's a more uh, positive impact on the economy. It's a more impact on Alaska families in cutting the PFD. But the exig- exigencies of the moment are to cut it and, um, and, and to keep uh, the other constituencies, the constituencies that hire lobbyists uh, and can swarm Juno with people, um, uh, uh, with sob stories, with Johnny's sob stories. Uh, that's, uh, that's, you know, that, that trumps what should be a, a better long-term fiscal policy. I, I, I know this is a theme I go back to on occasion, but maybe more than I should. But, you know, if Dunleavy, Dunleavy were a governor that was concerned about his long-term, uh, uh, the perspective of his administration from the long-term was-, was Legacy. Wanted, wanted, yeah, thank you. Wanted to be a, leg, a legacy governor. I think he would be looking at things like this to better position Alaska for the future. Uh, and better position our our fiscal situation for the future. You'd be looking at 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 you know at at, at, at changes in in Alaska's fiscal fiscal structure like this that would better position us for the future. But he's not. <laughs> uh, he's. I mean, he's he's he he still has the opportunity if he wants to do it, but he hasn't he hasn't taken the opportunity. One thing he could do. I mean, next year's budget when it rolls out, he could use the ten year average. Uh, uh, with sideboards and say, look, this is better policy to do this going forward. We do it with the PFD. We do it with the POMB. Uh, we ought to be doing this with uh, oil revenues as well. We ought to not be the tail on OPEC's dog anymore. We ought to be in control of our own of our own destiny with respect to oil prices and, and do that going forward. Well, he still, he still could do it. Right. And this is a whole discussion that we could have had, you know, talking about OPEC and Russia and all this other kind of stuff. I mean, that's one of the big things that, uh, you know, like I said, mostly we don't deal with national stuff on here. But this whole idea that somehow we stopped pursuing American uh, American energy independence is just it's just shocking to me that here where we are, we're now going to be dependent. uh, The economy is going to be based on around what OPEC and Russia and everything else. We're not pursuing our own energy agenda. We should be. We should be self-reliant. And if OPEC wants to do what OPEC wants to do, then so be it. But we're just we're just shying away from that. It's well, we're a free market economy, Michael. So so people make investment decisions based upon in private individuals, private citizens make uh, investment decisions based upon their own 
perception of 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 where the of where the returns are going to go, um, and and that will always, frankly, in the oil market, will oil put oil, always put us at disadvantage at a disadvantage to OPEC and to Saudi in particular, who make their investment decisions and make their production de decisions around their terms, uh, and can control what production does and what investment does. So. We're, we're it, it, that's more a function of, of the fact that we have a free market economy and they don't. Um, and they're a big enough producer to be the marginal producer and be able to control where oil markets go. We, we, to, to, to truly have energy independence in a way that we can seal the borders and, uh, and, and rely on our own oil and not have oil, have, not have Saudi bang us around, we'd have to change the way the oil industry operates, we'd have to make it a centralized control in the same way that Saudi's made theirs a centralized control. So it's, which I'm not a fan of, but I mean, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I just think it would put us, I mean, we would be on better footing if we had a little bit more energy independence from the rest of the world, but you know, it, and again, you're right. It's a free market. So it, this is what happens when we have government interventionalism going on in the free market. This is part of the problem right here. Let's uh, get a quick fix, a uh, quick uh, tease on number two of the weekly top three, Brad, we're going to go to break here. So give me uh, give me a little bit of flavor here. So there's a new ballot measure that's being uh, uh, pushed around. Uh, it's by uh, the same people that uh, did uh, uh, rank choice voting. So I know a lot of people on this program are going to, a lot of listeners are going to just immediately have an allergic reaction to it. But I think it's a good ballot measure. I don't think it goes far enough, but I think it's a good ballot measure in dealing with uh, campaign contributions and sort of ties back into what you were talking about in the first segment about the disparity between out of state and in state Democrat and Republican uh, contributions. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> that was a pretty shocking number, quite honestly. Welcome back to the program. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. We're continuing to talk about the weekly top three. We're on to number two, which is an initiative from Alaskans for Better Elections that deals with campaign contribution limits. Last year, those all get blown asunder. And we had no campaign contribution limits because it was struck down by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional. And we saw some campaign contributions going into the six-figure range, $100,000 campaign contributions. Brad, you say that this one is good. And uh, so explain why. This is Alaska for Better Elections, which immediately makes me nervous. So tell me why you think this is a good thing and why I should be convinced of that. Well, just a, just one minor correction. It was the Ninth Circuit that struck down our campaign. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Ninth Circuit, not the Supreme campaign Court. Yeah. Um, and and and, and the, the title, for those who are interested, the title in the ADN article, it was an ADN article yesterday, is Alaska Ballot Measure Filed to Reestablish Campaign Contribution Limits. There's a link in the first uh, line of the article to uh, to the actual ballot measure itself. What this ballot measure proposes to do, I, well, a couple of times last year, we talked, I talked about my concerns with sort of unrestricted, unbridled funding coming into coming into state elections and the, and the influence that's that, that that's having on uh, state elections, the top 20 percent influence that's having on state elections. And, and in part, I think we see that, uh, frankly, in the legislature when we have votes on the PFD. I mean, we have Democrats voting to cut the PFD uh, because they don't want to take on the top 20% because the top 20% is a, is a significant part of their, of their campaign contribution. So I think we see some consequence of unbridled uh, uh, campaign contributions. Uh, uh, we've seen some uh, influence or some evidence of unbridled campaign contributions. What this, what this uh, ballot measure would do is essentially update and then send us back to the, to the campaign contributions uh, limits that we had uh, before the Ninth Circuit struck them down. Uh, it would update the amounts so that campaign contributions would be limited to uh, $2,000 uh, each election cycle uh, to, a, uh, to a, a non-group entity or to a candidate. That's an update from the $500 limit uh, that was in effect when the Ninth Circuit struck it down. And the Ninth Circuit struck it down not, not, not necessarily on First Amendment uh, principles, which is where Citizens United comes from, uh, but struck it down because it was unreasonable restriction on individual uh, uh, individual rights or individual uh, freedom of expression. And, and, and in other states, uh, and the Ninth Circuit picking up on that in other states, um, left the impression that 
uh, reasonable, more reasonable, updated limits uh, uh, would be acceptable. So this adopts a $2,000 limit uh, per candidate, per person, per election cycle, every two-year election cycle, um, provides that a political party, uh, used, it used to be that a political party could give $1,000 to a candidate. This updates it to $4,000 double uh, in the same fashion that, uh, or quadruple in the same fashion that uh, to update it. Uh, in the same fashion that the individual limits are, are updated. And this provides uh, at the end uh, that those limits will continually be updated by adjusting them for inflation going forward, which was another another factor that the Ninth Circuit and other courts have looked at uh, in determining whether the re restrictions on campaign contributions uh, are legal. A couple of things that this doesn't do um, is because it can't be done at, at a state level, it doesn't override Citizens United. So while it does limit campaign contributions to um, individuals, uh, made by individuals to directly to candidates in their campaigns, it doesn't limit, doesn't put restrictions on independent ex expenditure groups right. coming in and making independent ex non-coordinated expenditures in support of any given candidate uh, at the state level, whether the governor or at the legislative level. And I, we've talked on the program before, I believe Citizens United is a problem because it allows unlimited uh, money coming into uh, the system. It allows uh, the, uh, the money to override other good policy influences uh, that ought to be uh, affecting legislation, personal money affecting, uh, affecting legislation. So um, I, I think Citizens United is a problem, but that has to be addressed at the federal level uh, it really can't be addressed at the state level. So it doesn't override um, Citizens United. There's one other thing that uh, that I've got to dig deeper into it to, to really understand how all these come together. But one of the problems uh, that Alaska experienced uh, with the initiative, and we may experience again with this initiative, is that initiatives uh, uh, are under different uh, campaign limits and uh, don't have the disclosure requirements right. uh, that uh, that Citizens United does uh, in some respects. So, and this doesn't fix that. Maybe not. So, maybe well, not a surprise because this is Alaskans for better elections, but right. but this well, do, this doesn't fix that. And so, it doesn't go as far as I think we need to go in campaign reform. But you know, I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I this this is a good positive additional step. I think. In, in reducing the influence of main elections. One final thing um, is this also goes back to the old limit uh, that we had in the state that limited the amount of outside money, non-Alaska money that could come into to individual campaigns to 25% uh, uh, of something. Uh, but it, it, limit, it limits the amount of outside money that can come in. To, uh, Which to goes state. back to my previous comment about right. uh, the Democrats raising 78% of their funds from outside sources. Uh, I guess the first thing that I ask myself when I see something like this and it's coming from Alaskans for better elections is, my first question is, who benefits? Uh, because, you know, it's I'm looking at what they've done in the past and what they're trying to do. So that's always uh, that's always uh, problematic. And what I find ironic about this is they keep going on and on in all of their ballot measures about dark money, which, of course, again, as you just pointed out, is a federal issue. The dark money issue is a federal issue. And I would like to see something change on the initiative process as well, because we talked about that here before. If you contribute to a ballot initiative, you as a private citizen are, are required to file an APOC report, even though they have all the information. We saw that we put a letter up here that was on the, that one of our listeners got that they were going to fine him $8,000 for not filing an APOC report for his four or $500 contribution. And um, yeah, some of that stuff needs to change. This doesn't address any of that. No. And, and, you know, that's something, if, if this goes through, that's something the next, next legislature could address. It doesn't necessarily be need to be done by initiative. It would be great if it were included, if the disclosure requirements were included in this initiative, right. but they aren't. So yeah. you sort of have, you sort of have to say, well, you throw out the baby with the bathwater. And I, and I don't think we do. I, I think, this is a positive step forward, getting restrictions back on individual contributions. We still have to deal with the Citizens United problem, but at least that's sort of put back in a corner, that's sort of put back in the non, non coordination corner of, you know, they can spend all they want, but they can't coordinate with the campaigns and we limit the amount of money going to the campaign. 
I think we need to talk about this more just so that I understand it a little better and we'll, it'll be something we can dive into. Number three of the weekly top three, uh, we're going to talk about transparency in the state investment program from the permanent fund itself. A uh, little too little, a little too late. I mean, what, what are we doing? <laughs> well, the barn door is open. So this is a Frank Murkowski uh, op-ed piece. Maybe the first time I've agreed with Frank in a long time. Uh, but an op-ed piece that, that I've taken from, let's see, this is the Fairbanks News Miner, June 11th, but I think it's all in the, it's in the other papers as well, and, and talks about the need for additional transparency, transparency with respect to the permanent funds in-state investment program, the, pro, the program where they've set aside $200 million out of the fund to be invested with, with money managers who then are going to invest it in in-state, um, uh, in Alaska, uh, investment opportunities. That's, I, I've had a problem with that all the way through. I mean, uh, any investment in state by the, by the permanent fund, that's what, that's what Hammond set up ADA for to do in state investments and, and has restrictions and, and limitations on funding and all sorts of things with respect to ADA. There's still problems with ADA, but at least it's in something of a box. Um, and, 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 and set up the permanent fund to, to look outside the state for the best opportunities uh, that there were, that there are, um, the, the in-state investment program set aside this $200 million to, for, for the permanent fund to start looking at investment opportunities, essentially doubling up on ADA. Um, and I think there's all sorts, there's corruption, there's, there's, uh, uh, crony capitalism. There's my friend needs a, needs an investment when, when you help him out. I think there's all sorts of problems with that, that, uh, that I've, that, that have caused me to be concerned about the problem. The barn doors open. That that opened the barn door. What uh, what Murkowski uh, Murkowski's piece does is say, okay, let, let's keep the barn door there and let's let's have some transparency. Let's let's make the money managers talk about, disclose, and then have a public disclosure of what the money managers are investing in, so that we can see we can have some light on these nooks and crannies of where these dollars are going, and see if there is corruption or crony capitalism or friend. Friend, friend, uh, friendly investment uh, going on here. I, you know, that's fine. If since the barn door is open and since we got this two hundred million dollars, let's go ahead and get a light on where that's gone. But let's close the barn door. Let's not do that. Let's not put any more money into it. When these funds close out, let's not reinvest that money in it. Let's just stop doing that. Go back to Hammond's original vision of having the permanent fund corporation investing outside the state. And Ada doing the uh, the in-state in-state investment and uh, and not go down this road again. But in the meantime, it's nice of Frank to say that we ought to have you know the light shined on the in-state investments we've made. Well, and it's this whole thing uh, is what Hammond warned about creating a politicization of the whole process by doing that in-state investing with the permanent fund. He talked about that specifically and how dangerous that was and. I think we could see some of the things that we've, from the Delta Barley Project to the fish plant to everything else, we've seen some of those boondoggles. <laughs> Which were yeah. Hammond's own projects. <laughs> I know, exactly. Uh, anyway, he understood that, I think, more yeah. than more than most. We've talked about this whole using the permanent fund to invest in state businesses, and politicians, of course, see that as the, oh, that's the ultimate. That's what we need. That's what we have to do. And uh and of course, the first thing that happens is who gets paid, right? Who's getting who's getting their investment taken care of by the permanent fund, et cetera. And uh, I mean, it's obviously problematic to say the least, Brad. You know, we got enough we got enough problems with you know the 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 Johnny or Jimmy going by the dime store window and saying, "Give me that," and the parent the parent doing it. We got enough problems with that with the with the state budget. I mean, starting down that road, my concern has been since they first started talking about these in state investments. My concern with that is we're putting that sort of, you know, Jimmy walking by the dime store window on steroids. We're putting the $60 billion, you know, permanent fund, permanent fund uh, out there uh, uh, on, on at, at risk of, of that sort of, that sort of investment opportunity, pleasing the constituents, pleasing legislators, please. You know, it's just, Alaska is a very small state. And once we start down that road, I just, I don't see a good limit on it. So, Thank goodness we only limited it to $200 million. Uh, I think Dermot Cole, frankly, has done a good job saying we ought to know where that $200 million went. I think Frank Murkowski joining Dermot Cole, never thought I'd say those words. Frank Murkowski <laughs> joining Dermot Cole 
in, uh, in, in, in saying we ought to shine a light on that. I think all of that is very appropriate, but right. at the end of the day, stop it, stop it at right. $200 million, unwind it when, when those investments unwind, I mean, don't, don't crash out of the markets now that we're in there because, you know, we'll have, right. we'll have even bigger losses, but stop it at $200 million. And as those programs unwind, take that money and go back outside with it. We've got ADA and, and, the, and we control ADA. We control ADA through funding. We control ADA through legislation. Uh, uh, let's not, let's not, we, we don't need a second ADA and we don't need one with so much money coming in and trying to, trying to influence the, the Alaska economy. Just remember, Brad, even a stopped clock is right twice a day, right? I mean, with Dermot Cole and Frank Burkowski, even a stopped clock is right. Um, yeah, no, I think this, uh, again, there's some danger there, and I'm glad that uh, somebody's pointing it out, maybe somebody with a little horsepower. So uh, interesting, uh, interesting stuff. Um, all right, Brad, <clears throat> final thoughts for today on all these things and what we're looking at and what's happening. I mean, the governor, we still haven't heard anything yet. On the I'm not happening. I mean, what? I don't know what's going on. I mean, it might be interesting to have Kathy Tilton on and ask her what what's going on here, because according to the landmine, uh, according to the landmine Sunday column uh, uh, two days ago, the legislature still hasn't transmitted the budget to, to, to Dunleavy. And I don't you know, he's got 20 days. So we're now not counting something, not counting weekends or Sundays or something. Um, so we're now at a point where if they transmitted it tomorrow, I'm not sure the governor has to act by the time the next uh, next uh, uh, fiscal year starts. So there's there's it, 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 this is too it's too long. There's something weird going on, either on the legislative side, either Tilton's up to something, or the House is up to something because they're the one, they're the transmitting body. It's their bill. Uh, either the the House is up to something or um, uh, the governor's up to something and working something with the House. Um, it, it's just, it's just odd. Maybe it's good. Maybe we'll see at the end that they have some trick play to out trick Bert. Uh, maybe it's good, but it's, um, I I'm just, I'm, I'm the, the longer it goes, the more curious I am about what's going on. Yeah. I'm wondering what's, uh, I'm wondering what's going on. Donna says, uh, the governor's team reviews the budget without having the official version in hand. Okay. So, but I'm, I'm wondering, he's got a, he's got a finite time frame to work here. Right. And if he does decide to veto a bunch, is he just running out the clock to the, till the end of the year so that there's no potential shutdown or, I mean, I'm curious as to what, is there, a, I don't even know, is there a limit on when the budget has to be transmitted? Is there a time frame, or is it just, they can hold on till it to the last day or what? I, I look, I looked and I can't find a limit on, I, I can't find a govern a, a governing. Doc. I mean, it's so that, so you, the, the, the body can hold on to the bill to correct technical errors and typos and, you know, miscalculations and that sort of stuff. They can't make substantive changes, but they, but they want to make sure it's a good bill when it goes. Um, well, you know, we're, we're about a month past the end of the session, aren't we? And, and we still don't have that. The whole bill would have had to have been typos to sort of explain it, explain right. it in that fashion. So I, I understand the governor's, I understand the governor can be looking at it, but you know, there's a, there's a process we're supposed to be going through. And this seems to be, this seems to be a, a significant break to the process. Well, I'm going to be, I'm watching, uh, you know, I'm watching to see because I, I keep waiting to see, um, you know, fingers crossed. I have my hopes up that maybe the governor will do something to, you know, squash some of the arrogance that we've seen out of the Senate. But, but I don't know. I just don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be. Uh, we, we may be ahead. here in July saying, oh, boy, weren't they smart by doing it this way? And I mean, they may be Bert in a corner, but. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not trans talking about transparency. It's not transparent. What the hell's going on here? So. Yeah. We're four days away from it being 30 days and we're, what is this? Uh, we're 15, 16, 17 days away from the end of the fiscal year. So this could get interesting. <laughs> I mean, it could, it could be, could be to back it up and set it up. So that the governor makes the vetoes on, June 30 and really doesn't give the legislature much opportunity or, or theoretically doesn't give the legislature much opportunity to react to it, but they still could. I mean, they could come back and they could override the vetoes and they could, you know, put the money in the budget, even though the fiscal year has already started. So it's not, I, I just don't, I, I'll be curious. I'm, it's more a matter of curious. 
it's not outrage right now. It's more a matter of curiosity about about what the tactic is uh, to to set it up this way. All right, Brad. Thank you so much for coming on board. I appreciate it, my friend. Good to see you. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.